Hi everyone, we're so glad that you've joined us at the Center for Brain Health for our event. Let's get started with a brief video underscoring the importance of brain health for you and for society. After that, we'll introduce our speaker. We work, we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here. Hello everyone, on behalf of uh, everyone here at the Center for Brain Health, we'd like to welcome you to the Frontiers of Brain Health uh, lecture series where we take a deep dive into the most exciting new developments in brain research. Uh, my name is Bart Ritma, I'm a professor at the UT Dallas um, uh, School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and uh, I do research also here at the Center for Brain Health. Um, I want to mention that we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer some questions. So for the virtual audience, uh, please uh, use the Q&A function. Um, and for those of you in person, um, have your questions ready to ask. We'll get to as many as we can at the end. Uh, and this presentation is also recorded. Um, and so for those of you who don't know much about us, the Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience research center uh, at the University of uh, Texas at Dallas. We have dedicated the past three decades uh, to exploring neuroplasticity and the brain's amazing lifelong potential to get stronger and better. Uh, still, uh, stay till the end to hear about our groundbreaking research study, the Brain Health Project. Now I wanna introduce our speaker, Dr. Jared Millman, uh, from uh, the University of California at Berkeley. He received his BA in mathematics and computer science from Cornell University in 1998. 
after working at the uh, Center for Neuroscience at UC Davis. He came to the UC, uh, he came to UC Berkeley in 2000, first is to design data analysis systems for the brain health, uh, sorry, for the brain imaging center there, and then as the director of research computing uh, at the uh, Neuroscience Institute. At Berkeley, he is co-founder of the Neuroimaging and Python Project, and he was the NumPy and SciPy release manager uh, for, uh, from 2007 to 2009. He also uh, co-founded NumFocus and served on its board from 2011 to 2015. Uh, currently, he is the release manager of Network X. In 2015, he became the he, he began in the biostatistics doctoral program. Uh, his interests include algorithms, uh, scientific computing, and neuroscience, and he's gonna be speaking us, uh, to us today about uh, the uh, scientific Python platform. Uh, Jared? Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a really pleasure to be here. Uh, this uh, was supposed to be my last in-person talk uh, before the pandemic, so I was supposed to be here uh, in May 2020. And uh, it's appropriate now that this is my first uh, in-person talk after the pandemic. I've had uh, many, many Zoom meetings in between. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, today about Scientific Python. Oh, sorry. Um, so I guess uh, probably most people here have heard of Scientific Python, but uh, I'm going to first uh, start with a little bit of a glossary, uh, just because um, when I talk about scientific Python, I'm really thinking of at least three things. Um, so first, it's an ecosystem of uh, Python packages or software libraries for Python, which is a programming language uh, that's widely used in scientific research and data analysis. Uh, and around that ecosystem of tools and libraries, uh, there's a community of developers, maintainers, and users. Uh, and the thing that's very special about this ecosystem is, uh, one, is it's a very decentralized ecosystem. Uh, each of the individual projects have their own uh, sort of structures and development process procedures, uh, independent decision-making processes. And uh, the other thing is it's largely volunteer. So um, the community is mainly uh, unpaid labor. Uh, and then most recently, uh, I'm going to tell you about this new project that we've just started called Scientific Python. Um, and uh, this is a, a, an effort that's really been about a year and a half, and a little bit less, and it's focused on trying to coordinate the ecosystem uh, with this decentralized collection of tools uh, and pro procedures, as well as growing the community of users and developers. Uh, in particular, we're hoping to get a whole other generation and, uh, of, of new developers to the ecosystem, many of whom will probably be volunteers, and perhaps some of them may be in this room today. Uh, so before I get into too many details, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a high level why you might want to care. Um, so uh, in 2016, uh, I'm going to take you know, just a handful of examples for, uh, from astronomy, just because it's a very high profile field. Uh, and it's also one that um, tends to have very expensive uh, research going on. So in 2016, uh, the very first uh, detection of gravitational waves occurred um, through the LIGO uh, collaboration. Uh, and this was when two black holes collided. Uh, you can see on the, the right, um, well, on the left, you can see that one of the facilities. Uh, there's two of them. Uh, one of them is Louisiana, and I think one's Washington State. Uh, and then here you can see uh, some analysis of that um, gravitational wave um, collision, or the gravitational wave themselves from this collision. Uh, and uh, this is all uh, done in Python, and these plots are done with matplotlib which is one of the, uh, it's the 2D plotting library for Python. Uh, in 2019, uh, you may have uh, heard about this uh, first imaging of a black hole, it was a computational imaging, uh, and this came out of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Uh, and again, this is a, a massive project that included many, many people, um, many, many different telescopes uh, across the, the uh, country, and it was a really uh, you know, exciting moment. Um, and this image as well is uh, done largely using software tools from the Python on scientific ecosystem. Uh, and then in 2021, uh, you may have also noticed um, we had the first uh, powered uh, 
flight on another planet, uh, Ingenuity. Uh, and Python is heavily used in this from the ground control to um, planning and uh, data analysis. Uh, and then just recently, uh, the James Webb Telescope, after many, many years, uh, has been launched. This is a new um, state-of-the-art infrared imaging telescope for astronomy, uh, and sometimes considered the uh, replacement for the Hubble Telescope, although they don't have the same imaging capabilities. Um, and then again, this is uh, from calibration to uh, analysis and data collection, uh, mostly is a pi all Python library or pipeline. So just to uh, give you a flavor, I think, of um, how important uh, Scientific Python has been in recent years. Uh, and there's many, many examples from many, many different fields. That's just a, a little flavor. Um, so now I'm going to give you a little bit of a short history. And uh, the reason I'm doing that uh, is I want to give you um, some sense of, I think, why this might be a surprising uh, outcome that Scientific Python has become so widely used in scientific research and industry. Uh, and this history is going to be a very um, personal one. Uh, and I think that's you know, largely the nature of this project. There's not like a central control. So instead, what you have is a bunch of individuals coming together. Uh, and each of us would have our own story to tell. Uh, and they would be unique and different, but a lot of rhyming. Uh, you'll hear a lot of rhyming uh, between these stories. So uh, while this is a personal story, I think it's uh, indicative of a larger uh, movement. So uh, as Bart had mentioned, uh, in 2000, I came to Berkeley's uh, Brain Imaging Center. And, um, you know, this is one of the early imaging centers, uh, and it's still the case, but uh, it was certainly the case at this point that uh, the analysis software for fMRI research was very, um, you know, lab uh, developed, very custom, very eclectic. Um, it was that. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and uh, it was also just written in many, many different languages. Uh, many of them commercial packages, such as uh, MATLAB or IDL, uh, which you may be familiar with and maybe you're perhaps still using, uh, as well as um, some open source languages like Perl and Awk. Uh, you know, basically just any kind of language you could get, uh, you'd find in some part of the analysis stream. Um, and, uh, you know, the software was not uh, really collaborative, so many of these packages were developed inside an individual lab or a research community. Uh, and they implemented the set, subset of algorithms that that research community was interested in or were trying to promote. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a mess. Uh, and then I started talking to some of my colleagues in around 2004 and 2005. Uh, we thought that uh, it would be better to have the analysis software written in Python uh, for a variety of reasons. And we founded a project called the Neuroimaging in Python Project, or NiPy. Um, and I'll just quickly read our mission statement because I, I think this is sort of a, a, some of the ideas that were percolating in the community in general. Uh, so we, our mission was that uh, we believe that neuroscience, ideas, and analysis develop together. That good ideas come from understanding, understanding comes from clarity, and clarity must come from well-designed teaching materials and well-designed software. And the software must be designed as a natural extension of the underlying ideas. Um, and so in 2004, 2005 though, uh, the scientific Python ecosystem uh, was pretty uh, much in its infancy. Uh, there was a lot of missing pieces, and uh, even uh, if you're familiar with NumPy, which is like the primary array uh, analysis package, uh, it, its first release came out in 2006. Um, so one of the first things we had to do was uh, engage with the ecosystem. So through this application of neuroimaging um, analysis is how I got involved in sort of a lot of the core libraries. Uh, and I think that happened to a lot of our pe people in the community they were uh, researchers or academics or students, and they were trying to solve a problem for their own research. Uh, and to do that, they had to build more general tooling. Uh, and I think a community formed around this sort of collaborative effort. And uh, it drew in people from lots of different fields. Uh, and then so, it, as I mentioned, around 2006, NumPy came out. Uh, and then that sort of uh, was a real boost to the ecosystem where a lot of packages now solidified and there was a, a sort of a, a language that the data could be transferred between these packages. Uh, and it, we started, uh, at that point, doing more promotion. And so around 2007, there was a special issue of the Computing and Science Engineering. Uh, and this is probably the first real publication that talked a lot about the Scientific Python ecosystem. And uh, it really much <laughs> filled the entire magazine. Um, so you can see uh, here, uh, the first you know, 50 pages or so were uh, entirely dedicated to Python, this issue. Uh, but if you went to the rest of the um, articles, the education article and the scientific programming are also a uh, Python one. So uh, there's only, I think, uh, a book review, um, something about homework, and then maybe one other article on this issue that wasn't on scientific Python. 
So you know, even though we hadn't had a lot of publications, uh, when we came in, it, we came in, uh, and there was a lot to talk about at that point. So it was really a quick, quickly grown. Um, uh, we also had a, a conference, the SciPy conference, which uh, is uh, now held in Austin. So if you're interested in going, it's uh, easy to get to. It's in July, um, and it's still not too expensive. Uh, but in the early days, I, I think 2008, this is uh, a picture of the conference. Um, it was at Caltech, and a, we were in a room that held a, at most 100 people, and we often didn't fill it halfway up. Um, so, you know, our conferences were essentially 50 people, 60 people. Uh, everyone was a developer of a major package, and it was a really easy time uh, to get around a, a desk with a computer and talk uh, and develop. Uh, but in 2008, things really started taking off. Um, and uh, I think 2008 was the last year we were able to fit at Caltech. We moved to Austin to a convention center there, or the, maybe the convention center, I'm not sure. Uh, in 2008, I also believe, was the first year we had a European uh, version of the conference. And I think 2009, 2010, we had our first uh, SciPy India. Uh, now there's like several of them. There's also uh, PyData conferences, so there's many, many scientific Python conferences. Uh, however, now that the community has grown really large, um, we've gotten so that uh, it's you know, really not a developer-focused meeting, uh, and it's become much more difficult for us to communicate in these venues um, and make plans and, and coordinate. Uh, in 2011, we um, were invited back to do another special uh, issue of the CISC. Uh, and then in 2012, um, we formed a nonprofit called NumFocus you may have heard of. Uh, NumFocus, uh, uh, different projects in the ecosystem can join it, or Julia or other languages um, can join this. And then uh, the idea is that you can become a fiscally sponsored project, so you can then uh, apply for grants through NumFocus. And uh, that was important for us because uh, in the early days, very few of us had positions where we could become PIs at universities. Uh, there was a lot of grad students, a lot of researchers. Um, and in order to get funding, we needed to come up with a mechanism. And since universities wouldn't allow us uh, to be PIs, uh, we had to create our own organization. Um, all right, so uh, at that point, uh, I mean, I really sort of see Scientific Python in sort of three decades. Uh, one is a decade that we're coming into. Uh, and then the early decade, you know, 2000, 2010-ish, um, which I just kind of described, although I went a little bit over it. Uh, but then uh, 2010 to 2020, we just saw a tremendous amount of growth. Um, and so I'm not gonna really try to get, you know, make a really strong case, I'm just gonna look at a couple examples. Uh, but if you went into any search engine and typed something like scientific Python growth, uh, popularity, you're gonna just find tons and tons of articles about people uh, pointing to different e evidence. Um, one of the first I remember uh, was this uh, blog post in 2017 that was uh, from Stack Overflow. And uh, it talked a lot about the growth of Python, and in particular of um, scientific Python as part of one of the drivers of that. Uh, but Python itself as a programming language has become very popular. And again, you know, I'm not gonna get too detailed of this, but uh, you know, you're going from 2012 uh, to 2017, and I think this is just looking at like, something like views, questions that are related to one of these packages on Stack Overflow. And uh, you can see many, many languages uh, were more popular in the beginning of 2012, and uh, at this point, 2017, uh, Python is the most looked at uh, search term, I guess, on Stack Overflow from high-income countries. Again, I'm not, you know, it doesn't really matter the specifics of this slide. You can get many, many slides with different axes, and the trend will be the same. Python just keeps going up. Um, uh, here's just a similar graph, except now comparing it to things like R and uh, less popular languages like Go and Rust. Uh, here's another piece of evidence from 2018. Uh, so this is a survey that went out to a small sample of 126 people uh, in industry, uh, in enterprise, and asking them what tools they use in data science. Uh, Jupyter is a project that's more of an interface than part of the scientific Python ecosystem per se, but uh, it's developed um, out of a scientific Python ecosystem project, and still a lot of the community members are the main developers of it. But NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, um, and Pillow are all Python packages. Uh, and this was not a Python promotion. Uh, this was just you know, asking people what they did. Yep. No, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no, nothing you can invest in, unfortunately. I know. Um, so this is a, a, a infographic uh, that the NumPy developers put out uh, in 2019, I think. And uh, you know, it's just a pretty picture for one, but I wanted to point out just the top level row. So um, in December of 2019, uh, on PyPy and uh, another place you would download these packages, they were getting 24 uh, million downloads, and you know. 
a lot of this is obviously automated, uh, but you know those numbers are in the hundreds of millions now, uh, just a few years later. Uh, I don't remember their methodology, but they estimated 10 to 15 million users worldwide, which I'm guessing is a fairly um, conservative estimate. Uh, but the, the other thing I want you to look at is these last two numbers. So it's you know widely downloaded, uh, widely used, and uh, have been developed for about 20 years. And at this point, it had a, uh, $1.4 million of total lifetime funding. Um, and that was because we had just gotten a grant. Uh, so the very first grant. Um, and now I think we're up to our second grant, and I think we're getting closer to $1.6 million uh, for NumPy, uh, which is extremely cheap. Uh, it's also typically over that 20-year period, it's had no more than about 10 uh, really active maintainers. Uh, they were doing the majority of the work. Uh, and then out of that 10, it's often the case that you're looking at really like one or two people that do the large share of the work. Um, and at this point, I think with that 1.4 million, uh, we were able to hire one or two uh, programmers uh, full-time uh, for a few years. Uh, another piece of evidence is that uh, in around 2019, uh, you started seeing uh, CEOs from different companies uh, give talks. and. Often you would see your face, or I would see my face, or my colleagues' faces uh, on the screen behind them. Uh, and so here's an example from uh, the GitHub keynote, uh, which is uh, owned by Microsoft, uh, where they're just talking about how uh, by using the stuff that they provide, uh, you get access to all these developers. Um, and of course, uh, they don't actually pay for any of the development as well. Um, but hopefully someday. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is, uh, you know, early on it was a little bit of a, a difficulty for us getting published, uh, but in 2020 uh, we came out with two papers, a NumPy and a SciPy paper, uh, Nature Methods and Nature, um, and, uh, you know, it's really not the case that many people cite uh, software papers in their uh, publications. That said, uh, these numbers are pretty crazy. Um, so SciPy has already been cited 5,300 times when I printed this out a few weeks ago, and um, I'm guessing it's probably closer to 5,600 now. Um, you know, many, many accesses, uh, and then the same thing for NumPy. So uh, even though I think very few papers that use this stuff cite us, uh, it's still very, very uh, cited, and I think it would be, um, continue to be the case uh, that this is gonna be cited more and more over the next coming years. Uh, and then this is just another, uh, you know, point. Uh, so scientists are also uh, not putting our faces up in this picture, but uh, the packages are mentioned. Uh, so this is a, uh, Katie Bowman, who um, is a Caltech professor at Caltech and was one of the computational um, imaging people that uh, was working on that black hole image. And uh, she's very uh, generous in some of her talks to recognize the contributions that our software have made. Um, and then uh, it's also now uh, not only just useful in industry and academia and being used in lots of high power scientific uh, research, but it's also being widely used in teaching. So just at Berkeley, for instance, uh, there's now courses in scientific Python or Python in general at, in the computer science department, uh, the data science division, the school of information, neuroscience and statistics, just to name a few. Uh, and I'll just point out a, a paper um, uh, about a, a course I taught at, uh, at Berkeley uh, in the statistics department. Uh, about computational reproducing with neuroimaging that I thought would be of interest to this group, and you can find a link there. Uh, and it really is the sort of way I imagine uh, teaching of neuroimaging should be done, and uh, one of my co-authors, Matthew Brett, uh, is still doing that kind of teaching right now um, and has a grant to do, to do a, a course right, I think, this semester. Uh, so just to conclude this section, uh, the use of scientific Python is now pervasive both in academia and industry. Uh, it's being used in many uh, novel and leading big science projects. Uh, and the ecosystem itself is continually improving, growing, and responding to needs. Um, and at this point, uh, despite the fact that this is a, a project that you know, started with uh, people working nights and weekends, uh, often with their professors uh, telling them not to do this kind of work, um, and uh, instead to focus on academically valid work, uh, Scientific Python's grown to become, I think, critical uh, research infrastructure. And uh, it needs to be treated that way, I think, both by faculty and universities, but also uh, funding agencies um, and industry. Uh, so just before I talk about the Scientific Python project, um, I'm going to go through a few lessons and challenges that I think, uh, you know, lessons that I think to contributed to our success uh, and challenges from the model that we, uh, we have. Um, so first, I just want to argue that the adoption of the software, I think, is extremely unusual. Um, and that's because, uh, you know, who developed the software? So these were uh, often people that had full-time jobs, uh, you know, starting faculty 
uh, you know, grad students, uh, researchers, and you know, against the you know, getting uh, prom you know, promoted for this or encouraged to do this work or even being paid to the conference, go to the conference. So like many of us had to like pay uh, out of our own pockets to go to Caltech for the first few years because uh, there was no money for us to even attend these meetings. Uh, fortunately, the conference itself didn't cost anything. It was just a flight and board. Um, and uh, the other thing is that this was developed by people that weren't software engineers. These were often uh, researchers. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of the authors uh, who authored major packages in the ecosystem, they did uh, that as their very first Python project. Um, so IPython started that way, Matplotlib started that way, many of them, uh, that's you know, first out of the bat using a language. It was the language, you know, the project they used to learn the language. Um, the other thing is when this happened, uh, so it was a very distributed community, uh, and now uh, this sort of open source distributed development is a really common model. Uh, GitHub and other tools have made it very easy, uh, but at this point, uh, it was really difficult. Uh, you know, we didn't have Zoom, we didn't have Skype, uh, we didn't have GitHub. Um, you know, com collaborating was much, much more difficult remotely. Uh, and then the other thing I think is that what did it replace? So there was large commercial projects um, from MATLAB, IDL, for example, uh, that had been around and developed for over 20 years at that point when we first started, maybe 30 years, some of them. Uh, they had you know, hundreds of full-time software engineers, not to mention sales teams, Q&A teams, uh, you know, market, all kinds of marketing and uh, management structure. Uh, and they had millions and millions of dollars, uh, I think in the tens of millions of dollars of annual profit, uh, which you know, at this point we still are just starting to get any influx of money and it's not profit. Um, so uh, given how unusual it is, you know, why is it not surprising? You know, many of us did this thinking this would happen. Uh, and I think it really is three, three things. So principles, practices, and people. And I'll just uh, highlight a couple of the ones that I'm thinking in particular. Uh, so I think the main uh, principle is that scientific research software just must be community developed and community owned. Um, this is not a resource I think you can hand over to a commercial interest. Uh, you know, perhaps, uh, there are aspects of research that are really important that can be handed over, um, but this is just not one of them. And that's possibly because of the nature of scientific research. You know, it really is the language we express our, our ideas and analysis in, uh, and you need to control that as a scientist. Um, and I think the way we've developed these projects is really the best way to align the incentives for doing uh, good quality, transparent, reproducible research. Uh, in part, is uh, you know, letting people see your work, I think, is always a, a really good, healthy practice. The other thing is that the importance of language and library choices uh, just can't be underestimated. Um, so one of the reasons that I think scientific Python took off is that Python is a great language. Uh, and you know, many of the other scientific Python or scientific computing languages uh, start as general or special purpose languages that then have to add on features to handle uh, web services or internet or cryptography or database or any other thing that you're going to do. Uh, and it just is the case that when you're doing scientific research, at some point, you're going to need to put stuff on the internet, or you're going to have to control some hardware, or you're going to have to access a database, or some other thing. Uh, and so MathWorks and these companies have to implement this stuff. Um, by choosing Python, which is a general purpose language that has uh, quote unquote batteries included, uh, you just get all of that stuff for free. And then the scientific research, we can focus entirely on the analysis part that we care about. Um, Python's also um, really prioritized having readable code and uh, being oriented to humans and not the computer. So it's known as a slow language to execute, but it's a really fast language to write in. Uh, and in particular, it's a really good language to, uh, fast, to write code fast that's correct. Um, so it's you know, the case that it, the way it's written, um, you often can write code on, and after you write it the first pass when you go to test it, it's not very difficult to get all the bugs out, where certain languages, uh, it can be a real chore to deal with bugs. Um, then practices, and I, I think the real key here with practices is what I call deliberate practices. So I think it's just a community of people that are naturally interested in tools. And so uh, you know, not only every time they, you know, they keep doing the same thing over and over again, but not the same thing, right? Every time you do it, uh, you reflect on it, you think about it, and you uh, just slightly improve that process. Um, and so for the last 20 years, I think the community has been doing that, and we've developed you know, some fairly nice uh, mechanisms that. Uh, I think if you have heard Chris speak, um, or Chris Simmons, uh, he also has mentioned uh, that this is the kind of way reproducible science needs to be done. Uh, 
And so that includes things like revision or version control, uh, testing and continuous integration and code review. Uh, so we keep really careful track of our code. Um, and whenever people make changes, uh, we run a whole automated suite of tests against it. Uh, and uh, this is not my own. Um, and uh, we also do code review. And that's something that I think you know, industry is starting to adopt some of these practices more and more. Uh, but it's just the case that you know, in, in open source code, no, almost no, or at least in the scientific Python ecosystem, almost no code goes in without a discussion. So you propose the change, automated tests are run, and that just begins a conversation with the other developers about whether the feature's right, uh, the API's right, whether it's tested adequately, documented adequately, whether it's worth including or not. Uh, and then there's a lot of focus on documentation, which I think is also partly because um, there's a lot of academics and uh, teachers in the community. Uh, so getting the documentation is really important. Um, and then finally, governance. So uh, these uh, sort of distributed communities, decentralized uh, governance structures become really important because uh, there's not a, this you know, traditional top-down hierarchy where you can just say, here's a decision maker. Uh, and so decision making can be very confusing at first. Uh, and you know, figuring out how to navigate that thing requires really setting out the, the governance structure. And that's something our community's been iterating on as well. And I think we're starting to, to have reasonably good governance structures. Um, just really quickly, this is a little bit more of a schematic version of what it looks like to make you know, a new contribution to a lot of our packages. Uh, so there's some repository of the, the code, uh, and then you get a copy of that, and then you make a, what's called a feature branch where you do your work. Um, and you keep making little uh, commits or uh, snapshots of your work as you go along. Uh, once you're happy with that little line of work, uh, you make what's called a, um, a, a pull request. And just also, I should mention, while you're doing this work, you're also testing constantly to see that uh, each of your changes uh, is making things better and not worse. Um, and then once you submit a pull request, that begins this iterative process of discussion and review and, and comment. Uh, that's a, really a, a collaboration between the authors and contributors. Uh, and then finally, after this iterative process where the tests are again run, uh, an accept or reject decision is made. Um, yeah, so people, uh, for the Scientific Python project, which is this new project I'll talk about in just in a moment, uh, we believe that healthy communities are built when everyone's voice is heard, when their perspective is valued, and then when their work is recognized. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a really uh, important thing. Uh, if you're going to have a really nice collaboration, uh, you need to really respect one another and be considerate. Um, and the reason why you want to do that is that work is done better in collaboration. It's more fun, and often the outcome is better results. Um, and so just to really recap that, I think you know, community is extremely meaningful. Uh, and then the type of community you want to build it really depends on the culture. Uh, and you're going to have to have the right culture to have a good community. Uh, and leadership often sets that direction. Um, and you, you know, especially when leadership is diffuse in like our community, uh, having a good governance structure helps that expectation and, and make sure that uh, you've reduced misunderstandings. Yeah, so challenges. I'm going to go through this really quickly, but uh, you know, it probably is obvious. Uh, we've got lots of uh, stuff to do and little resources and little manpower or people power to do it. Um, that's the main challenge. Uh, so you know, developer time in this, uh, this process is extremely time consuming. Um, and now that the packages are so widely used, uh, you know, the, the review process is even more uh, onerous because we want to make sure that we don't introduce bugs that get onto a helicopter on Mars and cause it to crash. Um, and so uh, another thing is that uh, a lot of corporations are offering small little pots of money uh, for things like the Google Summer of Code. Uh, and that's a very uh, you know, low reward uh, prospect for many of our projects. Uh, you know, the amount of new contributions we get in uh, are very variable, and then whether uh, those people who work on these projects stay around is like not a very high success rate. Uh, but it is very useful for big corporations like Google because they're able to spend very little money uh, and get a lot of training for possible internships, uh, and they're also using us for screening. Um, you know, so we're happy to do this work because a lot of us care about training the next generation of people. Uh, but even the sort of the traditional funding for this has been really like a small uh, amount of money for a lot of work. Um, and so the general thing is funding has just not been something we've dealt with. Uh, and partly it's our, our model, we don't charge people. So even, you know, for example, when we do get grants at Berkeley uh, to work on this stuff, uh, some of that money has to go to MathWorks because uh, they've got a really good marketing team. And if you work at Berkeley, which I'm sure many of you uh, at Dallas may also be paying, uh, there's a, a hidden tax that uh, goes to some technology group that then gets shuffled off to the corporations. And so, um, you know, even when we finally do get funding to work on scientific Python, uh, 
you know, there's always a tax that has to go to these corporations. Um, uh, the other thing is that uh, funding is not so easy for us. Uh, so many of us already have full-time jobs and can't work full-time on these projects. Uh, so you know, I'm not in that situation now. I am working full-time on this, but uh, many of us can't. Um, and so when we get new projects uh, or we get new funding, uh, sometimes we have to bring in new people to the community. Uh, so they're new community members and they're working full-time, uh, generating lots of code that then uh, people uh, in the community who are already overworked, uh, doing too much stuff, then have to find an extra weekend to review, and uh, typically these are really large contributions. So uh, even when we get funding, it uh, isn't immediately an, an, e an easier life for many of us. Um, it's also the case that, uh, you know, since many of us are working in our part-time on this, that, uh, and we have just enough time to maintain our own projects, which have become very successful, uh, we don't really communicate across and coordinate across projects. Uh, and then that is obviously gonna create a, not a very unified user nor developer experience. Uh, so that's uh, why we've created the Scientific Python project, and you know, our real goal is to better coordinate this ecosystem and to grow the community, and we're doing that through four main uh, approaches right now. Um, so I'll talk mainly about the first three because we've done a lot of work on them now, and then the fourth one is uh, sort of a more up-and-coming, what you'll see over the next year or two. Uh, we'll continue in the other ones. But, uh, so the first is just doing a support and develop uh, shared infrastructure. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, just you know, provide some tooling that everyone can take advantage of. Um, and then we're uh, starting to try to figure out how to foster the next generation contributors, uh, and also we're trying to create mechanisms and a forum uh, to coordinate across these projects. Uh, and then finally, this uh, community vetted uh, strategic sort of decadal plan, uh, which I'll say a bit about. Yeah, so I'm not gonna say much about this part because I think uh, it's kind of a straightforward idea, but uh, I'll just mention a few pieces of uh, shared infrastructure we've already started in the last year, most of this over the last six months. Uh, so it used to be that you know, each of the projects had their own developer meetings and their own calendar, uh, and so there's no place to find all the calendars, so now we've centralized that, uh, scientific-python.org slash calendars. You can find uh, you know, some of the community calendars and we're adding more. Um, we also created a, a Hugo theme uh, for websites, homepages. So now um, uh, when you go to numpy.org and scipy.org and scientific-python.org and a bunch of other sites, uh, they'll look the same because uh, we're maintaining that theme. We've also created a, a, a shared dis discourse or discussion forum, uh, and traditionally all of the projects had their own mailing list, uh, and so if you wanted to keep track of all the discussions, you'd had to like maybe join 30 or 40 mailing lists. Um, and then it's also, if you're a user, you're asking a question, you're not typically asking like only a question about one of the packages. you're probably using many of them in conjunction, so it's more natural to have a, a unified uh, discussion forum, which is starting to grow. Uh, we've also created a developer statistics uh, website. So for some of the, what we call the core projects, uh, we're looking at um, how many, uh, what we call pull requests they have, uh, how many issues they have, and keeping track of that over time so that projects can keep better track of uh, how they're doing, but also we can compare against each other. Uh, and we just recently created a blog where um, we're hoping to be able to put out uh, the kinds of information that we haven't been traditionally. So uh, we'll often have release notes and documentation uh, but sometimes they don't really capture the excitement or uh, like why you should really care uh, about some new features. So this gives us an opportunity to like have a little bit more of a impactful, uh, hey, check this out. Uh, you should be, if you're using random numbers, like this is the kind of random numbers you should use now. Um, and then uh, fostering the next generation contributors. So this has been a, a real issue for us because uh, I mean, I think uh, in one of the talks I heard earlier today, I think Dan had mentioned uh, uh, he's interested in this field because it's a, a sort of a green field. There's lots of room to come in, and that's always the case. When you come into the beginning of a project, uh, it's easy to like have success because everything needs to be done. Uh, there's lots of work. Um, and when we started this work in the scientific Python years ago, there was uh, the packages didn't exist. They weren't full of features. Uh, no one had been working on it for 20 years. And so, if you're a new person coming into the community now. Uh, the barrier to entry is much higher because uh, the projects are well, much way more established. The code bases are way more complicated. Uh, there's less obvious stuff that needs to be done. Um, so one thing we're trying to do is create new types of uh, teams and new types of roles. Uh, and we think there's a lot of advantage of having cross-project uh, stuff. So right now, um, you know, each individual team is probably too small to have its own accessibility expert team, right? Because uh, they, but if you get, people across all the projects, then all of a sudden maybe, you know, we only need five or 10 people in the whole community that really understand accessibility. Uh, and so we're trying to come up with new cross 
you know, project kinds of teams. Uh, we're also creating new teams just to handle our own work. Um, so one thing we've done is create these things called community managers. Uh, and some of these uh, names will be familiar to people in the community, uh, but we're hoping that this will be a, an area where maybe new people can come in and become community members. Uh, the other thing we're doing is uh, creating a social media campaign, which is a new uh, endeavor for a lot of us. Um, so we have a Twitter feed that you can go to, and uh, in particular, we're starting to release a series of uh, develop or onboarding community videos. Uh, so right now we have some interview videos, uh, but in about two weeks uh, we'll start uh, releasing um, you know, much more about uh, onboarding new, new contributor videos, and I think those will be really nice, and uh, I encourage you to check them out. So for the coordinating forum uh, and mechanism, so the forum we're using this discourse, uh, but for the mechanism, we're creating this new thing called the uh, SPEC, or the Scientific Pipeline Ecosystem Coordination Document, these specs, and um, these are a little bit new for us, so we've already had enhancement, pro so enhancement uh, proposal processes in place for many of the projects themselves, uh, but there, uh, there's a decision-making process. Uh, we've got this decentralized collection of projects, and so these things are not gonna have an up-down vote. Uh, instead, there'll be recommendations, and we're trying to put procedures in place so that uh, you can go through and decide which uh, recommendations are more important than others. And to do that, we've created two new groups. Um, we've created a steering committee uh, where we're drawing people from the community that uh, have you know, a lot of uh, influence and expertise. Uh, and we're also uh, identifying things that we call the core projects, uh, which we're using uh, not just for the specs, but for a lot of our early, early organizing stuff. Um, so for the steering committee, this is our initial uh, cohort of uh, steering committee members. Uh, and so you can see if there's you know, quite a few of us, um, but it's also the case that this people's drawn, these group of people are drawn from a lot of different projects, uh, which I believe is one of our first you know, sort of cross-project teams. Um, and uh, we're gonna be growing this group in the same way we grow lots of groups. So uh, people that come up and show up and uh, start doing a lot of work uh, will all of a sudden be asked if they wanna do some more work. Um, and so that's the way it goes. Uh, the core projects we have now uh, or this list, we're hoping to grow this as well. Um, but these core projects essentially are ones that we've identified uh, that either provide basic uh, data structures, uh, drawing primitives, or uh, fundamental algorithms that are used in many, many different projects across the ecosystem. Uh, so these projects are ones that will be more likely imported uh, in any random scientific Python project uh, than other ones. Uh, but there's many more that we'd like to include in this list. And so finally, this uh, community vetted strategic plan. So we've really, as a community, never had a roadmap. Uh, over the mo recent period, uh, a lot of individual projects have had individual roadmaps, uh, but these are more like uh, just random wish lists because uh, we typically are not funding roadmaps. We don't have the people assigned to them, um, but they do like provide a, a, a sort of post that people can look at and say like, oh, this is something I might wanna work on. Uh, and so it does help uh, create some form of momentum. The other thing is that as we're looking to get more grant funding, it's gonna be increasingly important that if we're gonna have large uh, multi-project grant submissions, that we're gonna to have to have you know, something on the order of like a large community vetted project with white papers that have uh, identified clearly what the needs are um, for important scientific research. Um, and so to do this plan, um, we're going to be uh, doing a bunch of site visits and conducting different meetings with different groups and identifying important uh, communities of people using scientific Python and try to ask them what they are gonna need in the next decade or so. Um, and so really we've got this vision where I think in the first decade uh, of the development, it was really uh, largely driven by individual needs and uh, individual efforts. Um, and then that sort of next decade of 2010 to 2020, uh, these individual projects became, you know, went through a real period of maturation uh, and adopting you know, codes of conduct and governance structures to, and really formalizing the development process and uh, creating these uh, sort of aspirational roadmaps. And uh, this decade, what I really think we're gonna try to focus on is thinking more strategically across the projects um, and the ecosystem as a whole. And uh, it's gonna be important that we use this document to get funding. Uh, so we're really hoping to identify some really large scale plans that would really require work across many different projects. And to do that, it's gonna require uh, a lot of sustained effort over the long term, and that's not gonna happen when we just rely on volunteer work. Um, we also are gonna need, uh, if we want to grow our community and have increased participation, uh, we're gonna need funding. Uh, it's just not the case that everyone's got uh, the time and the uh, privilege, let's say, to uh, spend their nights and weekends uh, working on something that's not giving them any resources. 
especially when you know the kinds of work that this involves. Uh, if you're somewhere like the Silicon Valley, uh, you could make a lot of money uh, instead of no money. Um, and uh, the other thing is the community is just starting to get funding. So uh, we don't have a lot of experience running grants. And so one of the things we're going to do as part of this project is uh, try to educate uh, the project developers and maintainers about uh, you know, what the grant writing process is like. There's an art to it. Uh, we're also going to be uh, spending a lot of time talking to different program officers uh, and funding uh, agencies about uh, what kind of funding needs to be done. And hopefully, uh, we'll be getting some new mechanisms for funding. Uh, we'll also be spending some time talking to um, people on review committees uh, to make sure that they uh, are able to like talk to some of our project uh, maintainers and let them know what, what a, a review process looks like and what kind of evidence and uh, information they would need in order to like positively review a proposal. Uh, so finally, I'm just going to say a little bit about uh, what you can do. Um, so uh, you know, many people here and online will be academics. And uh, one of the things I really would like to see going forward is that um, there's a lot more people contributing uh, to these projects. And I'd like to see more students do that as well. Um, and so I think to do that, we're going to have to be starting to think more about rewarding and recognizing efforts outside of paper writing. Uh, and then part of that's going to be like if you're sitting on a, uh, a review committee of either a grant or a paper or um, maybe a uh, tenure review process uh, to start thinking a little bit more about how that might look and what that's going to be like. And that, it's probably going to take some time for this to happen, but uh, I would encourage you to start thinking now. Uh, the other thing is I think it's important for us to start funding open and not closed software. Uh, so NSF and NIH right now pay tons of money, uh, increasingly uh, large amounts of money to corporations that are being used less and less. Uh, their software is less and less used. Um, but you know the, the disparity between how much uh, our taxpayer money and uh, foundation money goes to corporations whose software is like not that used versus how extremely uh, little money goes to the open source stuff that's increasingly used uh, is just out of just out of sync, um, and particularly when this software is being used on projects that are. Uh, you know, billions of dollars over budget already uh, to not have any any money for the software that uh, you use to plan your mission, uh, to control your software, and to analyze your data seems a little bit foolish. Um, and finally, uh, you know, I think I'd mentioned a little bit before about how uh, we've been developing through deliberate practice these uh, procedures uh, that I think you've also heard other people at uh, UT Dallas, uh, Chris Simmons in particular, uh, mention these practices are really important for reproducible scientific research. Um, so, you know, I'd like to encourage you to, uh, to try to apply some of these lessons, and in particular, uh, testing code. Uh, you obviously can't show something's correct by testing it, uh, but you can certainly see that it's incorrect. Um, so it's a, a very good, uh, you know, not sufficient but necessary thing to do. Um, executable papers, uh, this is something I also have heard Chris talk about. So uh, just automating everything you can do, so automating processes and procedures. Um, and being able to have papers where uh, you, you type something like make, and uh, it will then uh, generate from some kind of source file, like your papers and your figures and your tables. Um, I would highly encourage that. Uh, I also think we need to encourage collaboration much more widely, and credit needs to be given out more. Uh, I think science traditionally has had this problem where like big important prizes can go up to like maybe three people. Uh, and so you get these things where you have these projects that you know, take thousands and thousands of people to work on them. And then three people who are already uh, really well known and well off, uh, then uh, at the end of their careers to get even more well recognized uh, doesn't seem like a very reasonable thing. Uh, and then I think the other thing is to in start insisting on open code and data uh, and methods in general. Uh, and so when you go to review and, and when you're publishing, uh, these are things to look at. So when I review papers now, uh, you know, I often find people saying, uh, yeah, you can find my code here. And so what I do is I click on that or go to that uh, URL and uh, look for the code. And then I try to get the code and I try to run it. And uh, I don't think I've done that once successfully without any iteration. So even when uh, papers say they have it, I think it's worth checking. Um, it's just often the case that uh, you know, if you don't check, things aren't correct. Um, most certainly are not correct. And uh, there's another paper I'll point out. There's a book chapter where uh, Koth and I go into a lot more detail about uh, these procedures and practices, and particularly in the context of how we think they should be applied to scientific research. 
Um, and just one last thing, uh, there's a paper I'd also encourage people to read, uh, going back to this idea of and doing more than just the paper. Uh, so Ryan Abernathy, who's a geoscientist, um, uh, wrote a paper recently about the scientific papers outdated, uh, and you know, lots of arguments in there, but you know, he's sort of suggesting that for lots of reasons that uh, people should start thinking more about uh, publishing you know, code with data and uh, documentation um, instead of the scientific paper, which uh, you know, some people have talked about as more of like the advertisement for the research. So I think um, maybe less advertising and more sharing your work is the idea. Uh, but it's, it's a thoughtful piece I think is worth reading. And then finally, um, in addition to that, I think just being the right thing uh, and what people should be doing, there's a lot of concrete benefits uh, to contributing to this kind of community. Uh, so one is, um, you know, it's increasingly being used in really important science. So contributing to this uh, lets you impact tons of scientific research uh, in lots of different fields, stuff that you would not be able to do necessarily otherwise. Uh, and it's very impactful. Um, you know, so just if you look at those NumPy and SciPy papers, uh, the citation rates, and again, you know, people aren't in the practice of citing software. Uh, so those really undercount, um, you know, and, you know, it's probably unlikely that I would ever be on an, any other kind of work that would have it that much impact or citations. Um, the other thing is that, it, you know, this procedure is uh, slow where we do review and, and feedback, but it's really a good learning process. Uh, and as a community that I think, uh, you know, especially having this deliberate practice aspect to it, uh, but it's really useful to go through this review process. It can be painful at first, uh, but overall the code at the end's better and I think uh, you're, you'll be a better developer. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, I think as a scientist or a researcher or maybe just a human, uh, we should want to be agents in our world and we w should want to control uh, how we uh, interact with the world. And by being a community member, you get to shape the tools you use. And uh, you know, as if you're doing active science, I'm sure you spend an increasing amount of time working on, uh, on code. Um, and so you really should have control of the thing that you're using. And uh, it's a very nice community, and we would like to have more people join, and that's an open invitation. Um, so finally, I'll just uh, say that uh, you can go to this new uh, website, scientific-python.org. Uh, you can learn more, and there'll be increasingly more information there. Uh, we've just started. Uh, it's a small effort right now, um, and you know, we are slowly bringing more and more people on board. Uh, but it'll be ramping up, and I, it'll probably be more of a flywheel approach where you, things go slow at first, but then as momentum picks up, uh, it, hopefully it will be hard to slow it down uh, instead of slowing, speeding it up. Um, and then on this website, you can find links to lots of things like our blog, our Twitter account, our YouTube channel, our discussion forum, and uh, many other things. Um, so yes, uh, thanks everyone, and I'd love to have some questions. Yes, or maybe get the phone or a microphone on. So first of all, I, this is maybe a personal question for what you're doing here. So does BART know NumPy? Is your group part of that? Are we part of NumPy? I don't know if anyone here has contributed, but I mean, I, uh, it's certainly installed on all the computers. Uh, I mean, uh -huh. it comes on, they're used to uh -huh. come on Mac. I even. didn't know if we, if it was kind of a family member here, NumPy, or if we are not, I don't think, not quite. I don't know. Uh, Just, so, I mean, there's definitely more stuff in Austin. Uh, I don't know that many developers in Dallas, and I'm not sure here, but that can change, I hope. So are you, so now are you, doc I didn't get to hear the introduction. Are you doctor? Oh, sorry. You can call me it, but I, uh, yeah, I, I took a. Uh, <laughs> you're you're working too much for no yeah. money. So um, well, I'm not like I'm not being paid as a grad student now for that exact reason. So um, the pandemic hit, and uh, I had a fellowship that ran out, and then I had applied for two grants uh, that both came in in May, uh, but they were for software development, which is not my research. Um, and so for the first year of the pandemic, I. Uh, was getting paid as a grad student, uh, not able to work on my research, uh, instead of working on software. Uh, and so then after a year of that, I decided um, I was just gonna put my dissertation on hold. Um, I'm already a candidate, so I just have to turn in one at some point. Uh, and just do it. Yeah, just I'm gonna, do I'm, it. yeah it's just on my do. list, it's on my list. I mean, this is so I have wicked year. smart. What you're doing, I mean, to create this is just I mean, like it's, it's mind-boggling. I'm people like, what? You, this person just kind of creates this. I mean, it's really mind-boggling. I mean, it's a good community. Um, 
a lot of really uh, really good developers. Well, thank you nice for caring so much and inspiring us to make You're sure welcome. we develop yeah. for all. I love just your principles. It's very inspiring, Jared. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, these ideas have all developed in the context of discussions with lots and lots of people. So uh, I try to say we all the time because I never know what I contributed. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, one, a couple of ideas that come to mind in, in line with the future uh, goals you have. It, I, there's a lot of effort toward national databases right now. And one of the challenges of having contributed to those is they're very labor intensive and it's also very hard to get the data out of those databases to use them. This type of programming seems like an excellent remedy to all of that. And I, I wonder if it would take a little bit of funding. And I, I actually imagine that national institutes probably, or government institutes, let's just say, would, would likely support this. Because imagine if there was a, a developer, a talented developer who is now part of curating some of those databases and, and helping the grow the user base by, you know, the contributors essentially needing to have a, someone, you know, able to do this to contribute because it, it, it has all those sort of wonderful open source properties. And I, I think for maybe not that much money by government standards, you might be able to get a lot of buy-in, you know, from that aspect of, because it's so universally yeah. applicable. Um, I, I think that's one really strong area. So just your reactions to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a huge decentralized fan. I mean, I think there's problems with decentralized and you need to think about coordination, but uh, you know, it, I think centralized things have the characteristic that they seem like they're easy to get going fast. Um, and they often start fast, but I think that uh, they often drag slow as they get going, uh, where the decentralized approach, I think, has the hard time of getting started. But um, by its nature, like uh, every time you take a step forward, like all of a sudden there's more people stepping forward. Um, and uh, I think it has, you know, one is it's you know, also resilient, uh, so it makes it harder for one person's mistakes to have lots of problems. Uh, so, you know, often if you have a centralized system, uh, people are gonna have a, someone's gonna design it, it's gonna have a design, uh, and then people have to follow that design, and if it's the wrong one, which it often is, because uh, it's really hard to design things right, um, you're gonna end up with a problem where if you have a decentralized thing, you know, the sort of the evolutionary natural selection process can take over where uh, lots of people have different ideas and it's not really clear who has the right idea, but uh, hopefully the right idea will be the one that's the most useful uh, and easiest to work with. Uh, and so by that criteria, I think it would naturally percolate up. Um, and I think it's also we're in a time now where I think even sort of politically, we're starting to realize that uh, there's limitations to having everyone completely coupled together. Uh, and so I think, you know, the research community needs to take some of those lessons as well. And I think, yeah, for data management, for sure. Um, I mean, there's that classic uh, essay or short story by Kafka about the burrow where uh, basically this animal like spends time like putting all his food in like one big central location and then panicking and then like spreading it out and bringing it back together. And uh, I think, you know, <laughs> I think we need to like, go back and forth, but I think, you know, more of the decentralized would be good. Oh, and I think it would cost a lot less money. <laughs> I mean, I, I know it would, because, uh, yeah. Uh, Jared, absolutely a fascinating talk. Uh, I know you can only speak about, like, scientific Python, but, like, one of the things, like, especially early on in the, in the talk, you were kind of contrasting it with other languages that are out there, um, things like R, and I just wonder, how does the development of new, I guess you could call them competing languages, something like Julia out of MIT, for instance, how does that affect the development of something like Scientific Python? I mean, I think it, it's great. Uh, I mean, I certainly won't say anything bad about other languages, uh, even though I could rant, you know, opinionated rants for a long time. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, basically I'm in the mindset that, you know, scientific programming or programming in general is really, really new. Um, scientific programming is really, really new. Computing hardware is really new. Uh, we're still developing a lot of the analysis ideas, a lot of the math. Uh, you know, even the ability to process large data sets is new and the type of algorithms and stuff will all change. And so I would, you know, I don't know if I would, but I think I would be very disheartened if in 50 years uh, scientific Python uh, was the best choice. Um, 
you know, the only way that I would want it to be the best choice is if it changes and keeps on top of stuff, which I would like it to do. But uh, you know, I think when new languages come out, uh, they have the ability to like explore new ideas much more easily. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully that these new languages either will provide a much better environment to do stuff in and that will become the future um, eventually. Or they'll like demonstrate their new ideas that are worth exploring and implementing. Uh, and it is the case that uh, you know, Scientific Python has like drawn from many, many different languages in part because the people coming in are coming from different language environments. So uh, you know, like the person who wrote uh, IPython uh, was a big Mathematica user and really liked notebooks. Uh, so IPython has more of a notebook feel. Uh, then uh, you know, someone coming from another field might have been you know, using more MATLAB and some of the ideas that they're brought from there. Uh, you know, Julia's got some ideas that I don't know we could implement right away, um, just because of the way it's structured, but it, it is in aspects uh, getting implemented in, in parts, I think. Um, I think, you know, Julia and R have the one problem, which is that uh, they're primarily scientific programming languages, and so there's just extra burden where, you know, when you specialize it too much, I think it can cause a problem, uh, and they'll just have more stuff that they need to handle. Uh, but yeah, they might handle it. Okay, uh, that's all the time we have for the virtual uh, portion of the uh, presentation. So I want to thank Jared for our virtual audience. We can keep questions uh, here uh, and here going, but we need to uh, close out. And we want to encourage everyone to uh, learn about the Brain Health Project. The power of research truly lies in how we use it to make the world a better place, so we've launched a large-scale landmark study called the Brain Health Project, which will help uh, people everywhere get proactive about maintaining and improving your brain's health and performance.